Well, thank you very much. I'm Casey Morrison. I'm a member of the Peace and Justice Group at Westminster. I'm also a convener of a subset of the church's Urban Mission Committee, which, which has dedicated itself to advancing the broad goals of the Wilmington Work Group. And we do that by mobilizing the church's human and financial resources to support the three pillars of the project. While that support is modest, what we will hear this evening is, is about the activities of the Wilmington Work Group and an update on a recent milestone in the project's ambitions to revitalize Wilmington's Riverside neighborhood and the entire Northeast side of the city. We're excited to have the two dynamic leaders of the work project with us this evening. Charlie McDowell, who's a member of Westminster, is chairman of the board of Reach Riverside Development Corporation, leader in the legal community, and has long been associated with Potter Anderson. Logan Heron Sr. is the chief executive officer of the work group and has been associated with numerous nonprofit organizations in the city. And as a testament to his extraordinary success at his work, last year, Logan was named one of the most influential Delawareans by Delaware Online and the large nonprofit CEO of the year by Delaware Business Times. Thank you, Logan and Charlie, for being here and for leading one of the most imaginative and successful projects that will fundamentally alter prospects for communities of need in Delaware. Uh, I'll leave it to the two of you um, to take us on from here, as is our custom. After they have, have finished, we will have some time for Q&A, and we almost always end about eight o'clock. Thanks very much. Okay, so thank you, Casey. I'm gonna do a brief introduction and then most of the presentation is gonna be by, by Logan. We certainly appreciate the opportunity to, to give you an update. I think that uh, many of you are quite familiar with this project. In fact, uh, Westminster is probably the most active volunteer organization. Uh, many of you have been involved with different aspects of our overall project, which as you know, the three pillars of the purpose-built community strategy are high quality mixed income housing, a, a cradle to college or career uh, education pipeline and health, wellness, safety and commercial facilities to serve a robust neighborhood. Uh, I'm going to, um, and, and what I want to say, one thing is important is to understand that what we're what we're trying to do in, in Riverside is to provide hands ups and not handouts. Uh, so job and career training are a very important part of our effort. Now I'd like to turn it over to Logan and let him tell you about our progress in various areas and, and connect you to the human elements of our work. Logan. Thank you, Charlie, and thank you all for having us uh, this evening. I'm excited to be back with you. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is show you our 2021 impact video. It highlights a lot of the work that we accomplished in 2021, and I think it'll give good context as we get into the presentation. Um, and then the presentation, I'm, I'm intentionally, intentionally going to be brief this evening because I know most, if not all of you, are aware of the work we're doing. Um, so I'm really going to focus on some key initiatives and highlights um, in addition to the video that I'm going to show you. So give me one second. I'm going to share my screen and my audio and enjoy. Six people have died in an outbreak of the new coronavirus. Governor John Carney says the goal is to stop community spread. Protesters filled the streets and roads in Wilmington. Organizers called it the, quote, I can't breathe rally. 
Cities on the East Coast are grappling with the devastating impact of Ida tonight. Historic flooding throughout Wilmington, Delaware, in places where it's never happened before. During this pandemic, we have seen uh, loss of life. We've seen that through the virus. We've seen it through violence. We've seen it through a Hurricane Ida coming through and ripping families literally out of their homes and displacing them. We're very proud of our efforts, but it's very unfortunate the things that we have to do. Um, we plan to be strategic, but when life happens, we have to be ready to adapt, be nimble. This has been a historic year, but what I've learned is that despite the social ills and vulnerabilities, our community has demonstrated its ability to withstand disaster, recover from adversity, and keep forging ahead. When I think about the work group, I think of positive energy, I think of excellence, and I think of change. Changing the lives of people, changing their attitudes, and making them feel better about themselves. Logan Herring and his team deeply understand the needs of the community, and we are thrilled to be part of the work that they're doing. Everybody's bought into the vision, the purpose-built community vision, comprehensive approach to improving a neighborhood and creating a great community. When you talk about the warehouse, we had the concept sometime in 2017, and we were done renovations in 2020, and then this thing called COVID hit. Really, it makes me smile every day to see so many teens in the building. They can participate in a variety of different programming. We're currently employing 55 teens through a couple of different career pathways, and so I'm just really excited to see that. Well, what I can say about the Kingswood Community Center first opened up in the year 1946. Out of fact, Kingswood's credited being the first interracial community center in the state of Delaware. We're there for education and we're there for the community. Anything you need, whether it be a jacket or a, a meal, Kingswood offers it. When I think of Kingswood, I think of a community, a whole, a home with everything you can ever think of, whether it's learning to food education or even a little further help with the community, whether it's with your electric or your rent. It's beautiful. I love it here. <laughs> Kings was, is a life for this, not only for this community, but for the state of Delaware. This is the model of a community that can come together to build bridges, to break down barriers, to build strong foundations, not only for this generation, but for future generations to come. Housing authorities in cities that were doing public housing, say in the 30s and 40s and 50s, were really kind of like putting all the affordable housing in one area. You basically create a concentration of poverty that doesn't have the supportive services that it really needs. Or we're going to be creating a mixed income neighborhood that will you know, keep the operating side positive, which will enable us to continue the supportive services. Typically government agencies do what they've always done so they get what they've always gotten. And this new approach and approaches like this, I think will yield great results as this idea of what Riverside is going to be including Kingswood, becomes reality. I think that that area is going to probably be one of the hottest areas in the whole city, maybe in the whole state. We want to make this a community that is attractive for everyone. Whether you live in Hokesson, Greenville, Riverside, Southbridge, we want everyone to say, I want to live in this community. And so it means that we should have incredible wellness centers. It means that we need to invest in our education. It means we also make sure that everyone here has access to an incredible job opportunity and the training and skill set to be able to be successful in that area. We're trying to overcome historical odds. To make that happen, we need to make sure that we have incredible historical investments. We need to continue to invest in the most disinvested areas, Riverside, Southbridge, West Center City, where I grew up myself. Our mission and our vision is really all about helping people to break free of the constraints of history and lives defined by poverty, geography should not define one's potential. So the work that we're doing is major.
So like I said, hopefully that gives you a, a good overview, um, some more context to the work that we're doing. Um, for you, those of you who haven't been able to make it out for one of our tours, I encourage you to please come out. Uh, I think Charlie is definitely leading in terms of uh, referrals for our tours. I think about 50% of the people that tour um, the work we're doing at Riverside have been invited by Charlie. So he's been a huge advocate and I'm happy to have him as a part of our team. Uh, I'm going to get into the presentation now. And again, I really just want to focus on some of the major highlights and achievements um, and also some of the key initiatives that um, really will show you the impact of the work that we're doing. And if time allows, I, I really want to show you one more uh, video um, because uh, I think you mentioned earlier, one of the milestones is that we just had our ribbon cutting for the new housing a few weeks ago. Um, and I'd love to share just one story of the many stories that we have um, that really highlights, uh, like I said, the impact of the work that we're doing. So let me share my screen again. All right. So just want to um, start really with statistically the current state. Again, just providing more context around the numbers in terms of um, what we have to overcome. And when I say we, the we is collective, which includes all of you. Um, because it really does take a village. And that's uh, why we call our community the new community we're building, Imani Village. Um, but if you look at the disparaging statistics, you know, less than a $10,000 median income in the public housing, 87% uh, of the households being led by single women. So we don't have that two parent household income. Uh, and then 64% of the children in the entire census tract living in poverty, which leads the entire city of Wilmington. But again, the model of purpose-built communities is that holistic approach that Charlie talked about, the high quality mixed income housing, the cradle to college and career pipeline and the community health and wellness. Uh, we're basing it on that model uh, of Atlanta. You know, they, 1995, they were, their nickname was Little Vietnam, um, but now statistically they are the example that we all can believe in and follow. So I'm gonna skip forward to our timeline. Um, it really starts with Charlie visiting Atlanta in 2014 um, with Rob Buccini and Mike Perzicki um, coming back and said, we have to do this in Riverside. In 2016, I joined Kingswood to turn around an organization that was about to go out of business. And sorry, my five-year-old's coming in. I see it, buddy, but I'm doing a presentation right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, in 2018, um, after turning Kingswood around in two years, we were able to use Kingswood as the foundation after we stabilized it for the other two uh, organizations to be, uh, be birthed and to catalyze. And that was really the beginning of the work group. And we entered into an official shared, official, uh, shared services agreement that really allowed us operationally to work together. In 2018, Reach Riverside became a purpose-built community and uh, since then, we have become the largest purpose-built community by way of staff and budget because of the way we're uniquely structured with the three organizations operating as one, Reach Riverside being the managing partner and Kingswood and the Warehouse being our service partners. Capital One donated the building that we now um, have renovated and turned into the warehouse, uh, which launched last year. In 2019, we started our official fundraising campaign and since then, we have raised over $84 million and leveraged $130 million uh, into the neighborhood of Riverside. And phase one and phase two are under construction and both will be completed by the end of this year with 141 homes um, being available to the community out of the 600 we plan to build. Um, these are some photos of the warehouse if you haven't been. And again, the warehouse is a teen center uh, designed for teens by teens, everything from the architecture to the programming and everything in between. Even our board co-chair at the warehouse is a teenager who is now a sophomore at Delaware State University on a full scholarship, but she started with us when she was in high school. Uh, and we've been working with her as well as a handful of other teams since 2018. Um, in our construction, again, 600 homes is what we plan to build. Um, and if you look at the bottom right corner, um, this is one of our contractors. It's a construction company called Trust. And this construction company is owned and operated by uh, a man named Derek Reed, 
who grew up in Riverside. And when we had a ribbon cutting, he told his story about um, right across the street uh, from the ribbon cutting, he sat on the stoop as a 16 year old with his 15 year old then girlfriend, now wife of over 25 years. And they dreamed about um, what they were gonna do in the future. And he never dreamed that he would actually be rebuilding the neighborhood um, that did so much for him, where he actually started his first business, cutting hair um, for the boys in the neighborhood. Um, the next big project that we're working on is, uh, I'll just say it safely, probably closer to a $50 million new Kingsway Community Center, pushing 100,000 square feet that will have all the bells and whistles. It will help our Early Learning Academy go from our 122 capacity to near triple that size to serve 200 children um, through birth through um, birth through pre-K and then another 100 children before and after care. Um, we will expand our senior center, our recreational services, um, and also have health services as we do now. Uh, the interesting thing about this project is that the young man you see here, uh, who's on the mural of the current Kingswood Community Center building, his name is Deontay Martin. And Deontay, uh, we did a video uh, talking about Deontay back in 2017 as a part of the United Way Do More 24 project. And it was a competition and this video uh, won the competition, but it also went viral. And in the video, Deontay spoke about growing up in Riverside, going to Kingswood. At the time we did the video, he was working after school at Kingswood. And he said, if it wasn't for Kingswood, he would be dead or in jail like many of his friends. Um, as I said, that video went viral. Brian DeSabatino, the head of EDIS, um, the con huge construction firm here in Delaware, uh, reached out to me and said, Logan, can you connect me with this young man? Every summer there, there on, he served as an intern at EDIS. And when he graduated from the Williamson School of Trades with a specialty in carpentry, um, the EDIS hired him this year. And he is now the project engineer for the new Kingswood Community Center building. So we have tons of stories where, but you can see it's full circle. And we have a tagline at uh, Reach Riverside, which is with the community for the community. And we truly mean that. Uh, I told you I was gonna talk about some of our flagship programs. RISE um, is our flagship program at the warehouse, reaching and investing in youth for sustainable employment. It's a 26 uh, week paid uh, workforce training program for our teens, whether they be in school and out of school. And when I say out of school, I'm talking about the youth the ages 16 to 24 who may have dropped out for some reason and didn't get a high school diploma. We're still working with those teens as well. We have a special carve out and contract with the Department of Labor to serve those teens during the day. And then those teens that are in school, we serve after school. Um, and this 26 week um, program, I like to, when I speak about it, I like to break it out in trimesters. So the first trimester, uh, you get these um, program under the, the program overview, these soft skills, you know, the basic customer service, social emotional learning, financial literacy, all of those things we need to just be employable, basic employability for any job we might pursue. Then the next trimester is um, actually an externship with a number of employer partners, everything from BPG, the Puccini Poland Group in culinary, you might see our teens at one of your favorite restaurants such as Bardea, Farmer and a Cow, La Cave. Um, they are also uh, employer, um, Partners such as Code Differently and Nerd It Now, where they're learning how to do coding or uh, computer hardware um, restoration, um, certified nursing assistant, marketing communications, um, agriculture, the list goes on and on. And so whatever piques our team's interest, we are trying to find employer partners in different career pathways to place them in that externship. Again, we pay them for this entire experience. And then the last trimester, we focus on brushing up on those interview skills, getting their um, resume together. And also, um, we have a partnership with Dell, Dell Tech where they can get a career recognized certification. And when they graduate high school or if they're already out of school, they can go and secure a $50,000, $60,000, $70,000 job with this 26 weeks of training that we've provided. Again, for this entire workforce training program of 26 weeks, we pay them at least $12 an hour, 15 hours a week. So you're talking about a high school student making a significant income while learning. Um, technical and soft skills to be employed for their next step in life. And even in the summer, we provide at least 25 hours um, of paid training. Uh, the next flagship program is at Kingswood Community Center. It's our early learning academy. And I have to tell you in 2016, 
when I took over the helm of Kingswood and I saw George Capanti come in. So hopefully he's still here. Um, George grace, graciously allowed me to leave the Boys and Girls Club was where I was at the time and come take this uh, interim position as the executive director of Kingswood. And I think if I had realized at the time when I was hired how daunting of a task that was, I probably would have stayed at the Boys and Girls Club. But I think it was a, a definitely a blessing that I didn't know um, because I took on this massive, massive um, undertaking, which was trying to turn Kingswood Community Center around. I was exposed a couple of months ago to just how bad it was at the time financially. We had seven days cash on hand and a million dollars in assets. Um, and today, between the three organizations, we have $55 million in assets and a full year's cash on hand for all three organizations. Um, I say that not to brag about you know what we've accomplished, but to really show how far we've come. And our Early Learning Academy is no different. Uh, when I <laughs> was at Kingswood in the Early Learning Academy and we first started, there was exposed asbestos in the ceilings, uh, on the floor. When it rained outside, it rained inside the building. We have a running joke that we had an indoor swimming pool because it flooded our hallway every single time it rained. Uh, we had uh, inadequate learning resources. Um, our staff was not uh, professionally trained. Um, they didn't have the educational backgrounds. But today, um, all of our staff have at least a child, um, children or child development associates, the CDA. Um, they all or many of them are working towards their bachelors. Um, our early learning academy um, director, she is working on her doctorate right now. And the last thing I'll say, and I can talk about, you know, how many. Um, awards and grants that our Early Learning Academy has received. Um, but the most important thing to me I can say is that in the last three weeks, we graduated our pre-K class this year, 23 students, 100% kindergarten ready with 100% low income population. That is unheard of. You can go around the country and trust me, you will not hear many stories like that 100% kindergarten ready. So that is just a testament to the team, the leadership, um, of Kingswood, the leadership of our Early Learning Academy, and the support that we receive um, from folks like West, Westminster um, and everyone on our education committee, which includes Charlie as well. So um, I can't say thank you enough. And I know our families are deeply, deeply um, grateful for all of the support that we're, we are receiving, particularly around our Early Learning Academy. So just to ground ourselves in the, in the construction, um, this was once an eight phase project for the housing. It is now a six phase project. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, uh, heard the great news that we received $26.4 million from the state of Delaware through American Rescue Plan Act dollars, which really allowed us to accelerate the planning of the housing um, and, and condense it as well. Uh, it was an eight phase project about 24 years long um, because of you know the success and the advocacy, we've really been able to expedite the plan. And I would say we've at least knocked this timeline in half um, to about 10 to 12 years, if not faster. We were able to expand phase three with an additional $26.4 million. And we're um, planning right now our third phase, which would be 200 homes. Um, like I said earlier, phase one and phase two is currently under construction. And all of this land that you see right here was once vacant. So when people talk about um, these type of projects, rarely do you see uh, you know, a plan where you can actually build homes on vacant property and avoid displacing anyone off the footprint of the property. Um, so when I show you that video in a few minutes, you'll be able to understand why it's so impactful that we don't displace anyone, you know, send them off to the wind and then try to attract them back because that just realistically doesn't happen. You can also see where the new Kingsway Community Center is going to be positioned. Where you see these home ownership opportunities right now is where the current Kingswood is. So once we build the new one, we'll move operations over um, to the new building, demolish the old, and then build more home ownership opportunities. We also have in the master plan home ownership opportunities here, 10, 10, and another 10 here. And then we recently um, were able to engage a private developer who has really um, come in in a major way and said, we want to support you and build transitional housing. So when we talk about that can, that pipeline of education, we're also doing a pipeline of housing. Everything from transitional, which really focuses on stabilizing families for a year or two, and then enter them into the pipeline of the mixed income rentals um, with the deeply subsidized, the affordable, 
market rate rental units, and then ultimately, which the North Star we believe is, is the home ownership opportunities in the neighborhood. Here's a 3D version of the master plan. Um, you can see, you know, contextually or geographically where downtown Wilmington is, where the warehouse is, Kingswood, all of the housing, um, plans to do a grocery store because we are currently in a food desert. And what that means is we just don't have access, um, you know, within close proximity to healthy foods outside of, you know, the ingenuity that we've come up with um, with our team, which is the innovation around having the, the state's first two community refrigerators, one outside of Kingswood in the warehouse, uh, where you can open that, that refrigerator at any given time and have access to food, um, healthy goods, vegetables, fruit, prepared meals. And I know you all have been supportive of that as well. We can't tell you how much we appreciate that because the community appreciates it. We also have a community garden at Kingswood, which also helps stock the refrigerators. And like I said earlier, we have an ag pod at the warehouse where our teens are learning agriculture and how they grow vertical farming inside of a shipping container. Um, I also wanna toss it back to Charlie, if you could, uh, address the Camorra STEM Hub while I take a drink and a breather at the same time. Gosh, how can I follow that? Uh, you know, this is a holistic uh, approach to neighborhood revitalization, uh, but the purpose-built people in Atlanta will tell you that it's education-driven. And this whole project got started because of uh, mine and Jocelyn Stewart's connection with Eastside Charter School. And uh, now Eastside Charter is... Uh, whereas a, a number of charter schools in the city are having trouble attracting enrollment. Eastside Charter is bursting at the seams. And so we're in the process of building a $22 million expansion, uh, which will be uh, primarily for the middle school and for the, for the honors program. But uh, through a partnership with Camores, Camores has got its name on the building because they gave us $4 million for the, for the project. Uh, they will also be providing assistance with the curriculum, providing mentors to come. And we have a partnership with the Women in Public Library. The library will manage the building as a community center in the non-school hours. Uh, the library does this uh, with, with all of its satellite locations. And so this would just be a nice expansion for them. Uh, this project is uh, using new market tax credits to uh, achieve the financing. And we've gotten tremendous support from major financial institutions, uh, primarily Discover Bank, who's providing over $10 million. Of, of uh, we expect to have a financial closing in, uh, in December and uh, be up and running for the school year of 24, 25. I wanna tell you about one really unique uh, part of the Eastside Charters Middle School Honors Program. And that is we have a partnership with uh, four independent schools, Tower Hill, Friends, Tattnall, and Sanford. And every one of our middle schoolers who are in this honors program is paired with a peer at one of those schools. And they go to school with their peer one day a month through the school year. And then there are reciprocal visits by the kids from the independent schools to come to, to Eastside Charter. Uh, it, it's a unique uh, program, I think. And the, the idea, of course, is we've had a number of... Uh, kids who graduated from eighth grade and have gone to those to those high schools and they've done okay academically, but they've struggled socially. So we're pretty sure that if you had an experience of spending a several years of a lot of time in one of those schools, you'll be a lot more comfortable with this situation and we think you'll have, have a lot more success. Uh, so let me throw, throw it back to you, Logan. Thanks, Charlie. So this is a $300 million project as it is now. When we started out, we estimated 100 million, um, but these types of efforts need significant resources. And so people always ask me, you know, what's the thing that keeps you up at night? What's the one thing you, you think you need to tackle that you really haven't? And it's actually is that um, we, there's a downside to our success um, because our project is very visible. We've been We've done a tremendous job in fundraising. People think that we're done or we've done enough. Uh, and we haven't. We're not nearly where we should be. Uh, we're about 130 million of that 300 million mark. And we need a lot more support and we need a lot more resources um, because the deficit in the neighborhood, the disinvestment is so great over decades and decades, and which has been promised and promised. Um, so we're making up for a lot of lost time. And also, I would say that we have to figure out how to do this in one neighborhood. 
it's obvious that the city of Wilmington has its struggles and there are particular neighborhoods that need this type of investment um, outside of Riverside, but we have yet to figure out how to do it in one neighborhood. Um, so my challenge is that I have to overcome our success uh, and continue to beat the drum and say, we need more um, because good enough never is. Uh, it, uh, the video we showed talked about our efforts um, with raising funds and supporting the community in times of need, particularly the um, COVID um, pandemic, uh, where we were able to step in in a time of need and provide gap funding to each of the families in the neighborhood for five straight months. Um, and then Hurricane Ida hit and we were able to do the same. Um, each family received $2,500 uh, and $5,000 to 24 families who lost their home completely because they were in an apartment complex that was completely condemned. Uh, and these efforts really allow us to build and establish trust like we never had before. And with that trust, we were able to launch a program last year called Empower. Economic mobility places ownership within everyone's reach. And this might be um, the biggest thing that we could do. And it's a thing that's getting notoriety um, around the country because it's the way we support economic mobility. Um, and we didn't understand a year ago when we launched this program that the first thing we would have to do was stabilize families, you know, help families in crisis. We saved 21 families from being evicted. Uh, and then we really got into the nitty gritty of how do, we, how do we help families plan for the future, plan for upward economic mobility. Um, and that takes significant investment. And so we talk a lot about the investment in the bricks and sticks, but we rarely talk about the investment in the human capital. And that's what Empower is all about. We actually have planned to invest a million dollars on an annual basis um, into Empower to help support families in upward mobility. And that's what we're doing with Empower. So um, this just talks about the return on that investment and how expensive Riverside is on an annual basis, $15 million. Um, so when we look just over the first two phases, the return on that investment will be $12 million. And um, that is a huge turnaround, not just for Riverside, but the entire state of Delaware. And then lastly is, um, if you can't tell, I love to create acronyms. Uh, so Restore is another program we created, Real Estate Strategy to Obtain Racial Equity. And so we've got some seed funding from Wells Fargo and JP Morgan Chase. Uh, we're in the queue for more funding, significant funding. And our goal is to acquire at least 40 acres of land throughout the census tract and convert blighted um, properties, um, unused or unutilized properties into communal assets um, to restore the opportunity to build wealth in the community of Riverside. So, so with that, um, I am going to, like I said, pull up one more video um, because it really, really shows you the impact of the work that we're doing. So bear with me as I get to that video. Um, and in the meantime, Charlie, is there anything you think that I missed that you would want <laughs> no, me to talk about? I think, I think you've done a great job of covering the waterfront. I, okay, I, I tried I, to do I, it as quickly as possible. You did, you did. All right, so I'm gonna share one more time um, and again, enjoy. My name is Clarissa Crippen. I was born in Riverside, but when I was two, my family moved to Second Street by the train station in Wilmington. But now I'm back here. Um, I just came back. Uh, I was homeless down in Merlin. They called me, they was like, Miss Crippen, your unit is up, but you gotta come back and start working again. I'm like, okay. So I came back and I heard through word of mouth that they were doing GD classes. Um, so I came here and I was like, oh, I need to get my GED. So they hooked me up with um, Dell Tech. I was at a terrible time in my life. I needed to go to rehab. It was just, I wasn't working. It was just, and I just admitted myself to rehab. And then when I got out, empowerment program about the um, the launcher program for business classes um, came up in our conversations. It really just gave me a plan and made me set in stone like what I need to do, what I have to go to in order to get into the new build. 
I wish. <laughs> moving. Moving. We're moving to the day's moving. I know. Hello, hello. I'm Clarissa. Okay, Mr. Driver. I love cooking. It's the best thing ever. My mom taught me how to cook uh, years, years, years ago. She passed away in 2007, but I've been trying to keep her legacy of Sunday dinners. So when I sold my platters, it was on Sundays. My business name is called Cripping Creations. My food is just soul food, and I don't have a set menu. I just cook what I like to cook. And I'm actually trying to get my loan for my food truck. It's so weird, like, living up to the day you move. <laughs> it's like, you gotta, you still gotta shower, you still gotta eat, you know? Like, you still have to do everything. <laughs> but we definitely been having fun living out of boxes for a month. Because <laughs> it's definitely been like a whole month. It's craziness. So I'm really just excited for the kids. They, I think they probably understand the move. Because as I said, we were homeless and living with people. I always made it like an adventure. Like when we were in shelters and shelter in Delaware, shelter in Maryland, like always made it like an adventure because they were so young. But now they get in like, oh, mommy gets the new house. Maybe we'll be here for a long time. Da -da 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 -da. So I think they're really excited. The next chapter of my life will be leveling up. Level up. Start anew. Keep going. Stop procrastinating and get it together. So I need to level up. <laughs> I mean, everything's already been going good since um, the REACH program and Kingswood Empowerment Center. Like, they really got me on the right track to start my level up, I should say. So everything's like really falling into place. It's really big, right? Yay! <laughs> I'm so excited. Laundry! It's the first thing I'm gonna do when I get my stuff here. <laughs> I'm so happy. Oh, come on, trucks. <laughs> come on, trucks. I feel like um, the new Imani Village will be different from the Riverside because the Riverside has been here for, I don't know how long, maybe 60, 70 years, I'm not sure, but. I think it's just gonna be hmm, a really good change for the community and for the people. As long as the good, the right people get into the community, I think it's all the way up. But from rehab to the business classes through Launcher and getting my business plan done and knowing about the grants and everything that I can get to better my business, like the empowerment program, they really, they really helped me out a lot. Right. But I'm excited for the community center there and the garden. I'm just ready to start over. A new beginning is always good. And the kids are excited. I'm so ready, <laughs> so ready. I'm so glad I was off video because I tear up every single time she does the twirl in the living room, I tear up. And then at the end of the video, I tear up again. Um, but again, that's the power of what we are doing. And when I say we, the we includes all of you. So thank you. And at this time, if you have any questions, please feel free. Well, thank you, Logan and, and, and Charlie. Um, I thought I was the only one brought to tears uh, listening <laughs> to that story. I've not lived long in this community, but fairly shortly after I got here, I heard these two men do a program on um, the work project. And I was stunned at the scope of what they were talking thinking, are these guys just pipe dreamers? And then I was mesmerized at the mere imagination that you could transform a community with extraordinary vision and energy. And every time I hear them, I could have you go on talking um, about this because it's such an extraordinary um, uh,
project. Uh, I want to thank you for coming. I, I'm, I, I have lots of questions. I'll ask one, one thing to start, and that is about RISE. The RISE program happens after school, the, the, the 20, 20 six week program, how is that actually operationalized? I, I tell you, our teams are busy. So they work 15 hours a week um, after school and um, 25 hours a week during the summertime. And for those students that are out of school, um, for whatever reason that may be, uh, they come during the day and we're able to provide them support during the daytime. Uh, so yeah, they have a busy schedule um, there's a lot, a lot of demand on them, um, but we know that's what's necessary because that is our next workforce. And too often um, in this society, we focus on the here and now and not going upstream. Um, so I think not going upstream is what has got us to the situation we're in. And so we don't have to just um, address the wound now and put the Band-Aid on now, but we have to prepare um, as well for the future. And so we are preparing our leaders of next of our of our community. Um, and I was one of those kids. I grew up in West Center City. And so there are a lot more Logans um, that just need that little bit of support. And they're going to be better than me. Like, that's my goal. All right. So if, if you have questions or, or comments, if you could uh, raise your hand and unmute yourself, uh, I'm sure Logan and Charlie would be happy to address them. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Did he? Yep. Uh, Logan, do you have a waiting list for the workforce training program? Uh, Empower or uh, Rise, which one? Rise. Rise, so we do. Um, so what we do is we we bring the teens in cohorts. Mm -hmm. um, so every Wednesday we have an open house. Uh, <laughs> the warehouse is getting a lot of attention um, through word of mouth, but also when you say you can pay teens for 26 weeks, uh, what we found out initially when we launched this program is many of these teens are offsetting the expenses of the household income, right? Because a lot of them come from households that need that additional income. Um, so we do, I would say that, I don't know if there is a waiting list, but I would say that more so that the demand is really high. So we're trying our darndest to fill that demand. Um, it's a good problem to have. And I don't, wouldn't say the wait list is tremendously long. Um, but we launch cohorts around every three months. Um, so it's, when it's time to launch, there is a heavy demand for that. And so, um, but I, we're doing our best to have the capacity to meet that demand. And we only have so much capacity in the building. Um, and we're averaging a little over 100 teams per day in the building. When you think about being able to serve teens in the city of Wilmington, them wanting to be in a facility. Um, that is, we haven't even been open at full scale for a year. And uh, I get chills just talking about it because yeah, I envisioned it and I thought it could be possible, um, but actually seeing it on a daily basis is remarkable. Amazing, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Logan, why don't you talk about how you uh, how you go about recruiting the, the teams for the RISE program? <clears throat> yeah, so we have a um, recruitment and retention specialist. Um, his name is Brandon Wallace, and he's done a remarkable job of going out to the schools, um, creating relationships with the teens, and then the teens, because they have an executive committee that really uh, rules the roost at, at the warehouse. They they do their own marketing via social media and they control our Instagram page. So it's really a collective effort. Um, interesting story. Um, Brandon Wallace is a um, young man who actually went through my nonprofit when I was about his age. Um, I ran a nonprofit with Eugene Young, who I'm sure many of you know, uh, and my brother, my older brother Shannon Watson. That we started that program when I was Eugene and I were 23 and Brandon was one of our um, students in our nonprofit and just to see that where he is now 
Um, he hosts many of our tours. So if you were to come tour the warehouse, he's very personable. Um, but all of our staff are able to relate um, to the youth that come in the building. Our director of operations, Winona, um, has three children and um, that are all teens. Um, but she also at one point of her life was homeless. Um, so, you know, I can go story to story and you really have to, you don't have to have gone through all the circumstances that teens have gone through, but you have to be able to relate. And so we do, when we talk about recruiting, Charlie, the first thing that came to our mind wasn't recruiting the teens. It was recruiting the staff, the talented staff that's able to uh, make these teens feel at home. And the teens feel at home because they actually design the facilities. They choose all of the programming. They actually review the adult staff on an annual basis. Uh, and when they don't like a program, they have something called the shade room where they'll bring that program partner in and say, you're not meeting the expectations and standards you set forth when you started. We'll give you another chance. It's restorative practices, basically. Um, and if they don't hit it out the park again, they send them on their way. Um, so empowering teens, empowering the residents to be able to decide their own fate and having them you know, take that um, seriously is really what makes the warehouse special and which makes the recruitment extremely easy. I see Sue Linderman raised her hand. Hey, Logan, thank you so much. I think this is the third or fourth time I've heard you speak and every other time your mom has been here. So I miss her. Tell her I said hi. <laughs> I, I will. She just left. She has, um, if you're familiar, she has a band and she tours locally. No, and I so, didn't know that. Yeah. So if you guys are looking for some entertainment, she often oh, entertains at yeah, Kingswood. I would and yes. Oh she's on goodness. the circuit right now. She was at the JCC a month ago and <laughs> she's all over the place. But um, <gasps> she just left here. She went to rehearsal for her band. Um, so now my son is building Legos because that they're like partners every night. They hang oh out my together. gosh! Well, I so I, I will I will I will share that you asked for her though. Yeah, and please. blow her head up as if she needs it anymore. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Well, that's a new opportunity for her. Maybe that would be wonderful. Uh, yeah, you it's, know, it's a jazz band, by the way. So it's, it's really? really really good. Oh, yeah. Casey, and she's the vocalist. Gonna... Yeah, Casey, yeah. that's very exciting. Yeah. All right. Well, Casey is going to sign her up. He's our, All he's right. our Just let me know. expert here. All right. Great. And uh, now every Sue, time you think... spoke, I'm sorry. I was going to say every time Logan speaks, I am struck by the creativity and the comprehensive nature of this and the adaptability and the flexibility and the it's it just feels so um, well organic is such an overused word but it but it it is just compelling um, how one piece leads to another and I think you're entitled to acronym slogan you demonstrated your ability to to deliver on those. And I know that from Westminster's perspective, any financial contributions would be useful, but not transformative. But I think the real question is, how might we as individuals or as a church get involved? And I don't expect you to answer that question tonight, but-, but Oh, I, you're gonna get I, it tonight. Oh, okay. You're gonna All get right. it right now. All right, then. There so, you go. so I talked about, so right now we <laughs> have, um, when we started this, about 250, 200 to 250, it, it's going to depend on how long things take. Uh, families that are moving um, from the old housing into the new housing. And so we decided to bless every family with a $250 gift card, whether it be to Target or Walmart, to help them purchase you know, things you might need when you're moving into a new house. You might not want to move in with the old couch or the old coffee table, whatever you need it for. So we decided that um, for every family that moves in, we're going to bless them with a $250 gift card. Um, so if that's something that fa you know families at uh, Westminster want to take on and say, oh, I'll sponsor a family or four families, whatever your heart is inclined, even if it's you know a portion of $250, um, we would be tremendously grateful to help us with that effort. Uh, and, and that's one thing. And then the, I'm going to respond to something else you said as well. Um, with the um, the creativity. 
uh, and I don't even, Charlie, if we shared this with you yet, but we're right now, I know we're going to do it. We just have to figure out how we execute it, but we're explore, exploring an ambassador program. And an ambassador program is where we would actually pay our residents, um, whether it be through cash or being able to help furnish their apartments and such to be ambassadors for the work that we're doing. Uh, and what that means is we often host tours and if we're going to be asking to walk into someone's home, um, why can't we stage that home, right? Uh, and so they feel proud about what they're showing. And that's something that we might be able to accommodate um, in order for them to be able to spread the word. What I don't like doing is showing you these videos and really peeling back the onion of someone's life that is really personal. Um, and then I'm going to use a provocative word, but say extorting it to raise dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that our ambassadors, our residents should be compensated for that um, because that money goes to them, um, maybe Clarissa helping to purchase or pay off that loan for her food truck or purchase equipment for that or so forth and so on. And, you know, our families are so ambitious and, and, you know, I'll tell you one last story, and then I know we're pressed for time, but um, I was told that a mother and her son were moving into one of the new apartments, and the son told the mom, mom, my bed feels so much better in this home, and um, the mom told the son, son, it's the same bed. That's the impact that this work is having. And so um, outside of the $250 and, and what I just told you, um, just continuing to spread the word, um, continuing to invite people to tour, um, that's, that's not say that's all we need, but that's more than enough right now. So thank you. Thank you. Logan? Well, I would how, add to, oh, sorry. excuse me, uh, Marlis, please. Just tell us how to do that. I know at the Imani groundbreaking, there was a special code that we could type into our phones, but tell us how to support, uh, how to direct those donations for each resident moving in. Absolutely. So you can go to our website, um, retriverside.org slash donate. I'm actually going to drop that in now, but we can also follow up um, with a communication uh, at a later date, and I'm sure Charlie will be right on it. Um, <laughs> and if you click on that link, it'll take you and you can choose the denomination that you want um, to donate. There isn't a 250 option, but you can hit other. And Charlie, I don't know if you know, is there a way, because you can do monthly, you can do a one time. Um, and I'm going to try it right now to see if you can add a note. Charlie, do you know if you can add a note to this? I might not, but we'll figure out a way. That's the way to do it. Um, but maybe we can figure out a special way. One thing we've done in the past is when we work with specific organizations, like we've done law firms and such, we can set up a customized page for you. And then you can just send out one communication and you can track how much just WPC has raised within a certain time frame or something. And we can do like a mini campaign, uh, which might be a little bit easier. I don't know, Charlie, what are, you, what are your thoughts that we can talk offline? Uh, that sounds good. I think you hit some good ideas. Yeah. I, I, I would and sort of I will that. follow up with you about that because we, our subgroup, um, has a, a small budget. And this is one of the things, one of the considerations that we would want to take under advisement as well. <clears throat> I would just so like I'm to follow. comment, we are um, supporting the refrigerator at the warehouse. And um, in addition to funding on the third week of the month, we've been collecting produce donations and taking them down. Uh, and I will tell you that I went down on a Sunday. We collect on Sunday. Normally, when we get there, the refrigerator is about a third full. Um, but this time on Sunday, all that was left was one Brussels sprout and a bunch of radishes. Clearly, radishes are not at the top of the culinary list for people in the warehouse area. 
Um, but we filled up the refrigerator with the produce donations that we've received. And as I was sitting there getting ready to leave, an older man walked up to the refrigerator, opened the door, uh, looked in, took out a package of strawberries and a single orange and closed the door and off he headed. And um, he turned and saw me and I said, enjoy your day. He said, um, this will make it lovely. Thank you. Um, package of strawberries and one orange. Yeah, you, you can't ma manufacture those stories. And Sue, thank you for sharing that because when I'm in the office, my heart warms. Like I'm in the office and I might be there for a few hours during the day. And I'll see three or four individuals or families drive up, walk up. And, you know, what some people might assume is that they'll get a big bag and fill. No, they're so respectful and responsible um, about making sure that they take what they need. Yeah. And it's it's a beautiful thing to see. It's just so simplistic, but so beautiful at the same time. It is. Thank you. Let me just follow up on one thing that Logan said, and that is things you can do. It's really important to spread the word. And if you know people who you think, you know, should might be interested in, in what this is all about or should be interested to encourage them to, to come to one of our tour and briefings that we do every other week. I, that's 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 just really important. That's what we have to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I also want to remind everyone who's who's on this call that we have opportunities uh, at Westminster to volunteer in the interest of the work project. You, you can contribute um, to the refrigerator. Um, you can contribute to the community garden by going down on uh, Saturday mornings um, and joining the team that's working um, in the garden. You can be engaged with Eastside Charter in the mentoring program. And I think, Charlie, I'm going to be beginning my tour of duty uh, sometime soon. Uh, you can be engaged with the early learning program at the Kingswood Center. These are all opportunities that are available to you at Westminster. There are three of us who are in that subgroup who are on tonight, Marlis Kerr, uh, Sue Linderman, Get in touch with any one of us to let us know what you're interested in contributing to. We'd be delighted to have you uh, participate with us to share the excitement of this extraordinary um, uh, program. We're about at that time. We, we could go on listening, uh, Logan and Charlie, um, to the information and the stories you have um, about this. Um, but we hope that you, those of you who have joined us this evening will be inspired to volunteer on some of the opportunities that we have at our project at Westminster or to independently go down in the community and, and play your part. Um, thank you all very much for joining us uh, this evening. Sue, have you got any closing remarks? No, just thank you once again to Logan and Charlie uh, for certainly for being here, but for the magic that is being created through such hard work, but such inspired work. We're so grateful for all that you do and um, appreciate your taking the time out to share it with us. So Godspeed. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all next time. Thank you. It's just all right. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.